Good morning. Good to see everyone here on this, the seventh Sunday after the Feast of the Epiphany. I mentioned to the um, eight o'clock um, participants, attendees, parishioners, <laughs> that we have some good news. You know, um, last week there was a 39% decrease in the amount of daily new infections. So it meant that there were like 445 new infections per day. And considering four weeks ago, it was over 2,000. We're moving in the right direction, which is great to see. St. Matthews acknowledges the people of the land who dwelt here since time immemorial and continue to live in this place today, the Tohono Odom, Soba Puri Odom, Paskagaki, and other Native Americans. We give thanks for the original stewards of this land, our ancestors, our elders, and all indigenous people. Let us always remember the people of the land in our prayers. As you know, today's liturgy will be live streamed on YouTube. If for whatever reason you're uncomfortable with that and would not like to be filmed, please let me know and I'll be happy to accommodate your need. So it looks like we're all go. I have to ask this every Sunday, <laughs> just in case. I'll be out of the office until next Sunday. Deacon Kim will be taking any pastoral care calls that we receive, and our senior warden, Eve Jordanic, will be in charge of the parish. Lent begins on Ash Wednesday, March the 2nd. We'll have a 12 noon liturgy and a 7 p.m. liturgy. So that's a week from this Wednesday. Please wear your name badge during the service and whenever we have coffee hour again. It really is helpful for us to get to know one another. And especially as some of us forget names from time to time. <laughs> also, um, some very sad news. Last Sunday afternoon, Lynchy Loring, one of our parishioners, passed away. Lynchy had been in assisted living for about five years now. And... Um, the, uh, I received a call from her family. I had gone and anointed her a week before, but uh, she is now transitioned to be nearer to God. The family has said that they'd like to have the celebration of life here, so I'm waiting to hear how we'll uh, set up those uh, that liturgy for her. My dear friends, let's join together as a people who have a mission to welcome all, to grow in God, and to serve our neighbor. This morning, our processional this morning is number 460, 460, verses 1, 2, and
Blessed be the one holy and living God. Glory to God forever and ever. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. We join in with the song of the angels. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you. be with you. Let us pray. God of kindness, interrupting our vicious cycles of resentment and revenge, teach us to walk the way of forgiveness beyond all accounting and to love the gift that has no measure through Jesus Christ who died for all. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the book of Genesis. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now, do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler all of all over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, 
so that you and your household and all you have will not come to poverty. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 37. We will read the psalm responsively by whole verse. The congregation's part is printed in bold. Do not fret yourselves because of evildoers. Do not be jealous of those who do wrong. Put your trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on its riches. Commit your way to the Lord and put your trust in him and he will bring it to pass. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Refrain from anger. Leave rage alone. Do not fret yourself. It leads only to evil. In a little while, the wicked shall be no more. You shall search out their place, but they will not be there. But the deliverance of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in time of trouble. A reading from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? Fool, what you sow does not come from life unless it dies. And as for what you sow, you do not sow the body that is to be, but a bare seed, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives us a bit of body as he has chosen and to each kind of seed its own body. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a physical body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the physical, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so are those who are of heaven. Just as we have become the image of the man of dust, we will also bear the image of the man of heaven. What I am saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people.
the Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Jesus said, I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great. And you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you a good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. The Gospel of the Lord. God's holy name be praised. Today, we're given an opportunity to hear a beautiful, beautiful reconciliation. It's Joseph with his family. Now, to understand just how powerful this reconciliation is, We need to acknowledge just how dysfunctional that family has been. It begins, of course, that Joseph is the 11th son of Jacob and the patriarch Jacob. And with that, he was the first son of the wife that Jacob had that he loved, Rachel. Because if you recall the story, Jacob was working for Laban, his uncle, so that he could marry Rachel, his daughter, who was much in love with him. And Laban had told him, you work for me seven years and you'll be able to marry Rachel. And so he did so. The seven years comes and uh, the night in which the wedding is to occur, Laban presents the older sister, Leah. Well, needless to say, Jacob is not happy with this and asks why. And so Laban says, well, you know, it's not right that the younger daughter be married before the older daughter. And so Jacob marries Leah. But then Laban, no doubt thinking he's doing a good thing, says, but do I have a deal for you? For seven years, if you work with me again, then you can marry Rachel. Now, had I been Jacob, I would have been strongly irritated. And in that I also tend from time to time to be a little cynical, I think I would say to Laban, oh, 
before we make this move, are there any other single <laughs> sisters older than Rachel? <laughs> because as you know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. So anyway, Jacob does work another seven years, and Rachel becomes his wife. Now part of the sadness in this story is that the anger that um, Joseph, or that Jacob has towards Laban for this trickery is displaced towards Leah. So that Leah has to experience a life of discomfort with her husband. And it's quite sad. But Jacob loves Rachel. And the firstborn of their relationship is Joseph. Now, he has 10 other children, but not from Rachel. So anyway, he wants to treat Joseph very well because of his love of his mom. Now, treating him that well causes problems with his siblings. That they become envious and jealous because the way in which Jacob celebrates Joseph and not so much them. And then as a teenager, in, the, in Scripture it says, at age 17, he is working in the uh, flocks with his brothers. And when his brothers do wrong things, he's a tattletale. And then there's the fact that he has two dreams. Two dreams in which he sees through various symbols, his brothers bowing before him. I'm not sure that Joseph understood the hostility his siblings had towards him because he shares these dreams with them. And of course, they're angry. And in the story, we know that his brothers decide to kill him. But then they decide, no, to sell him into slavery to tradesmen who are on their way to Egypt, which is what they do. Once in Egypt, Joseph experienced time being in prison, and then he's released, and he goes to a very prominent position within Egypt, close to being second to Pharaoh himself. So there's a remarkable transformation in his life. Now his brothers come, and at first they don't recognize him. And they are in need of food because a series of famines are about to begin, and already there is hunger. And with that, there is a desire for assistance. At this point, the Joseph reveals to them who he is. And quite frankly, there are so many options open to Joseph in regards to his brothers. There is the option of revenge. And there's the option of revenge that says he really doesn't need to do anything because living well is the best revenge. And then there is also the darker possibility that he would just let them starve. And yet what happens Joseph embraces his siblings, his brothers, and weeps with them. And in doing so, lets them know that he loves them and he will do what he can to care for his people. So from this, this forgiveness comes out of love. Now the brothers, in that they treated him so horrendously, there may be some question about how much can we trust him. I mean, possibly he says this, he gets us in there, and then we're all killed. Yet, Joseph remains adamant in his commitment to them. The power of love, the power of forgiveness. Today, as we listen to the gospel, we um, encounter the very heart and reason of being for Jesus, which is love. And in the words that we hear, Jesus encourages us to love everyone, including our enemies. 
Those are people who dislike us for some reason, people who may be contemptuous for various actions that they do, people in general we are to love. It's a strong message. And in a week and a half, we will begin the season of Lent, where through self-reflection and prayer, we can look at our own lives as followers of Christ. But we have from Jesus an example, not only through his words, but on the last day as we move into before the celebration of Easter, the day of Good Friday, we see that the one who was a great healer, a great teacher, and a great reconciler is given a great injustice, is execution. And yet, as we've heard in the story every year on Good Friday, as he's being tormented en route to being executed, his words are, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus not only encourages us by his words to love our enemies, but also by his actions. Not too long ago, Father Frank gave me an article by a Jesuit priest named Father James Martin. And Father Martin wrote an article that um, addresses how people respond when somebody who refused to get vaccinated dies. Father Martin comments, the welter of strong feelings can be disorienting. We see someone resisting vaccines or masking, which frustrates us, thus endangering others, which angers us, perhaps even endangering ourselves, which frightens us, and then dying. And then this should sadden us, but some of us are horrified to discover it doesn't. In regards to the decisions some people make to not take an action to help save their lives, there can be various responses on the part of those who do take those actions. One is a rather callous, oh well. But another is something even darker. And Father Martin actually gives a name to that. It's taken from a German word. The word is Schadenfreude. And what it means is to laugh at the misfortune of another. Certainly not consistent with what Jesus taught and in the example of life that he lived. Martin goes on to encourage us to see that this is a temptation, and yet it is not in sync with the message of Jesus and being a follower of Christ. And when we find ourselves possibly moving in that direction, Father Martin shares with us a question that is asked by one of the characters in Evelyn Waugh's work, Brideshead Revisited. The question is, when we find ourselves maybe moving in this direction, you find misfortune a subject of mirth. And it is to challenge us and to remind us who we are. Now let me tell you a little bit of a secret. Maybe not so much of a secret. But when someone preaches, they're not only preaching to others, they're preaching to themselves. So in that temptation, we all need to be attentive to where we are. Today is February the 20th, and it's the feast of Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass was a man who was born as a slave in 1818. And he was taken from his mother to be a gift to another family when he was eight years old. Now what's kind of interesting in regards to that is that the wife in that couple saw great potential in Frederick and wanted to have him educated, to learn to read. But her husband said that would make him of no value in the fields. And yet Frederick was a brilliant young man, and he found a way in which he could 
learn to read. And then at age 20, he left his situation of slavery and was bound for freedom. He became affiliated with a group that were called the American Anti-Slavery Movement. And in that he was a bright young man, he became one of their orators. And he was very prominent as an orator, addressing the wrongness of slavery. In 1845, he went to England because there was a bit of discomfort that his owner, because of him becoming so well known, his owner would learn where he was and take him back into slavery. He went to England to again address the need to get rid of slavery, to be an abolitionist. In the meantime, his friends, his friends gathered enough money that they were to buy the title of slavery for Frederick Douglass. When he was 14, he attended um, African Methodist Episcopal Church, the service there, and he had a conversion moment at that time. And that moment lived with him for the rest of his life. And it became part of the fuel of his desire to oppose slavery listening to the spirituals which were sung within the service, it became something that throughout the rest of his life reminded him of the evil and wickedness of slavery and then gave him the power to do what he needed to do as a follower of Christ, to love his enemies. And his way of loving his enemies was to proclaim the message of how evil, how wrong it was to own another person. For those who were his brothers and sisters in slavery, he gave a message of hope and encouragement, reminding them that the God revealed in Jesus is one that sees value in each and every human person. And for those who were in a place that they were perpetuating slavery, and other types of racism, his message was an education to them, to free them from the wrong thinking that they had, to awaken them to see the dignity in others. That was his way of loving his enemies. If we look at uh, Joseph again, we see a man who loved, who loved the people who were his family, who treated him horrendously, but we have to admit, as a 17-year-old, he was a little bit of an uncomfortable person. And yet, we see a beautiful reconciliation which occurs out of love for one another. In Jesus, our itinerant preacher, healer, teacher, and reconciler, we are given that message of how valuable each and every person is, even those who do not recognize their own value or the value of others. So we, as a people of faith, as followers of Christ, how are we to love our enemies? How are we to love those who do things which violate the dignity of others, do things that is antagonistic to the human community? How do we love those? Well, first of all, we love by standing with those who are victimized, marginalized. And secondly, we love by educating others in ways in which behaviors, attitudes, actions are harmful to the dignity of others. That is who we are as continuing in the representation of Jesus. Not necessarily easy, <coughs> but it's still a call to which we are to respond. So we're inspired by the reconciliation and love we see in Joseph. We are challenged by what Jesus calls us to do and to be. But we are given the example of Frederick Douglass and countless others to live the message of love God, love one another, love oneself, but do not forget.
to love one's enemies. Amen. Please stand as you are able, and let us express our trust in God through the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, according to the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, she is worshipped and glorified. She has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the Holy Catholic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. God of grace and glory, give us the gift of generosity that we may reveal your love and forgiveness and live in fellowship and peace with each other as we work for the coming of your kingdom through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, you are our delight and our joy. We seek to reflect your grace and goodness Make us slow to anger and not too ready to condemn. We pray that your church may be open and welcoming to all in need. God of peace, we pray for peace givers and peacemakers. We pray for all who are seeking to bring reconciliation and hope to communities and peoples. We remember all who have, been har who have hardened themselves or become insensitive, all who are afraid of being moved or touched, all afraid of close contact, all who are suffering from a breakdown in relationships. We pray for all whose lives are disturbed or distressed. We pray especially for friends who are ill or in need. We rejoice that we are created in your image. Free us from racism or any other prejudice that defiles us. May the church at all times reveal your glory and lead many to the glorious liberty that is for the children of God. In your power, O oh Lord, we will overcome all evil. We will triumph over death and rejoice in life eternal. We pray for loved ones departed, that they may rest in peace and rise in glory. Amen. 
And at this time, I invite you to offer your prayers and petitions, either aloud or silently. For the repose of Lynchy Loring, for those on our prayer list, for those who are suffering from COVID-19 that may come to a full recovery. God of peace, let us, your people, know that at the heart of turbulence, there is an inner calm that comes from faith in you. Keep us from being content with the way things are, that from the central peace there may come a creative compassion, a thirst for justice, and a willingness to give of ourselves in the spirit of Christ. Amen. Love casts out fear. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith. Merciful God, we have sinned in what we have thought and said, in the wrong we have done, and in the good we have not done. We have sinned in ignorance, we have sinned in weakness. We have sinned through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry. We repent and turn to you. Forgive us for our Savior Christ's sake and renew our lives to the glory of your name. Amen. Through the cross of Christ, God have mercy on you and pardon you and set you free. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. God strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in life eternal. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and make good your vows to the Most High.
Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. All thanks and praise are yours at all times and in all places, our true and loving God. Through Jesus Christ, your eternal word, the wisdom from on high by whom you created all things. You laid the foundations of the world and enclosed the sea when it burst out from the womb. You brought forth all creatures of the earth and gave breath to humankind. Wondrous are you, Holy One of Blessing. All you create is a sign of hope for our journey. And so as the morning stars sing your praises, we join the heavenly beings in all creation as we sing with joy. silent. You called the people to yourself as a light to the nations. You delivered them from bondage and led them to a land of promise. Of your grace, you gave Jesus to be human, to share our life, to proclaim the coming of your holy reign, and give himself for us, a fragrant offering. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, you have freed us from sin brought us into your life, reconciled us to you, and restored us to the glory you intend for us. We thank you that on the night before he died for us, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this for the mem remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, said the blessing, gave it to his friends and said, drink this all of you. This cup is a new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And so, remembering all that was done for us, the cross, the tomb, the resurrection and ascension, longing for Christ's coming in glory and presenting to you these gifts your earth has formed and human hands have made, we acclaim you, O Christ. Die, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Christ Jesus, come in glory. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine that they may be to us the body and blood of your Christ. Grant that we, burning with your Spirit's power, may be a people of hope, justice, and love. Giver of life, draw us together in the body of Christ. And in the fullness of time, gather us with blessed Matthew and all your people into the joy of our true eternal home. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, we worship you, our God and Creator, in voices of unending praise. Blessed are you now and forever. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we pray Jesus' prayer in whatever language we are most comfortable. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins 
as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The living bread is broken for the life of the world. Lord, unite us in this sign. the gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. Blessed be God who calls us together. Here's to God who makes us one people. Blessed be God who has forgiven our sin. Praise to God who gives hope. And Blessed be God whose word is proclaimed. Praise to God who has revealed us. Blessed be God who alone has called us. And all that we shall be given. Accept, O God, our sacrifice of praise. Thanks for all you have done. Our hands were empty, and you filled them. Give love to your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Live as true sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father. In the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you now and forever. Amen. Our recessional this morning is Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of Creation, number 390. And now let us go forth with empathy and compassion for all, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.